Okay, here I have a Royal Office Master 2000. I always wanted a daisy wheel printer back in the 80s and 90s when I was looking at the Radio Shack catalogs and other catalogs. Um, but I never had a daisy wheel printer, so I found this on eBay. There was a guy selling new Royal Office Master 2000s, a daisy wheel printer. It actually had, still had the staples in the top of it when I received it. I pulled the staples out. Let's see what is in here. Operator's manual. In here, uh, we have what looks like a daisy wheel, as well as a ribbon. Don't know if the ribbon's still any good. Probably not. It's 30, 40 years old. Just some cardboard, power cable, relatively standard looking one, some more cardboard, and a printer. This thing is actually quite heavy. Actually, a spot in there may be cracked. Oh yeah, I think the top is cracked. Cracked right there, right there. So the lid, uh, the lid is broken. And we'll have to take a close up of that. So there it is. Um, I'll bring us in closer to take some pictures. Okay, we do have the print wheel here. Let's see what it takes to install a print wheel. Hopefully the manual will explain that. I would say we've got the print wheel installed. What about attaching the ribbon? Open the dust cover, take the ribbon cartridge out upward. Now it seems, it sounds like I can make it enter a sort of a status print if I hold the top set button when I turn on the printer. So I'm going to do that, see what happens. Power switch, holding top set. Okay. Okay, Centronics interface. I would say it's not really your best looking ribbon that's pretty pretty light and missing a lot. Okay, when I first unboxed this thing and tried it out, you recall the uh, print quality was a little bit uh, faded out and I thought it was maybe a poor ribbon. What it turns out it was actually just this red lever here. This lever is where you set the pitch that you're printing with so it knows how far to advance the ribbon for each character printed. And I had it set to proportional when I was actually printing at like a 10 character pitch. And if you have this set wrong, then it will actually print one character partially over the top of another on the ribbon. Um, and that leads to part of the character being faded out. If you look at this ribbon, let's see if I can pop it out of here. You can see in there it actually whacks it and it actually punches out all of the, the ink where it hits. So it's um, after it's punched out a character on the ribbon, there's actually, um, you know, there's no more ink in that spot. So you can imagine if it didn't advance all the way, then the next time you printed out a character, if it hit over the old one, then you would be missing ink in part of it. This ribbon is actually dry. You know, if I touch it, it's not like an inky, um, it's not like an inky ribbon. Uh, I don't know exactly what technology is used, whether it's some kind of like wax, impregnated ink or something, but the nice thing is that a 30 year old ribbon seems like it might actually work. Uh, this is not, 
this ribbon I'm showing you right here is actually an aftermarket ribbon that I bought. I bought this one um, here and I'll put a link to these ribbons in the listing. I think it's amazing that you can still get ribbons for this printer today. Um, the original ribbon that did come with the printer worked, but while I was diagnosing the print issue, I kind of swapped it to this newer ribbon. I think I could plop the old ribbon back in, and now that I set the lever properly, everything would be fine. Okay, so it's been a couple months since I unboxed the printer. Uh, the guy who sold it to me on eBay did offer to replace the lid, but you can see, you know, my lid's still broken. Uh, after offering to replace it, I never heard from him again. I sent him a couple uh, emails, which went unanswered. Unfortunately, I had let the clock run out um, without submitting an eBay claim for item not as described, which is probably what I should have just done in the first place. So this would normally be the point in the video where I would point to a listing of his printers and say, hey, you know, this guy's got more printers, go buy one. Uh, but unfortunately, I cannot recommend him. I can explicitly um, say, be cautious buying these on eBay. If you get one and there's any kind of a problem, uh, do not trust the seller. Uh, submit an eBay claim right off the bat. Um, I'm not going to provide the guy's ID in this video. I don't like that kind of negativity in my videos. If you want to know more about the situation, um, just send me a private message. I'll let you know if you're looking at a listing. I'll let you know if it's the guy uh, that you should avoid buying the printer from. So the show must go on. Let's do some stuff with this printer. So one thing we could do is I could hook it up to some of my vintage computers. So. Uh, here we have a DB25 to Centronics 36 cable. Open up the case, there's the Centronics 36. It plugs in, in here inside the printer. Uh, simple enough. Um, with this, we could probably hook it up to my IBM 5150. I also bought myself a Tandy cable. Um, similarly, we've got a Centronics 36, and we've got the wonky Tandy 1000 edge card connector. Could do that. And I also have um, a USB to parallel printer cable. This would allow you to use this printer on a modern Windows computer or you know any other USB computer. Um, got the Centronics 36, got the USB there. It's like six feet long. Um, you may need a special driver. I did find um, on GitHub there's someone who did actually write like a Windows 10 driver for, for these uh, Royal uh, Daisy Wheel printers. So I'm not going to do any of those things because I don't think it's that interesting just to see a printer print. So what I am going to do is I'm going to try to turn this thing into a typewriter. Why not? Um, it's a printer. It accepts characters via the parallel port. Let's just find a way to hook a keyboard up to it. And we'll be able to type um, and the characters will print on the printer. Seems interesting. Uh, Daisy Wheel printers, kind of like a typewriter, ought to work. So let's get started with uh, designing that project out. Okay, let's take a look at the schematic that I made for my little typewriter board. So this is actually super simple. Uh, we have an Atmega 328 microcontroller. It is wired to a PS2 keyboard connector. So there's a clock line and a data line, a couple pull-ups, uh, as well as ground and 5 volt. I actually have somewhere in here I have a fuse on the keyboard. Always good to fuse your keyboard. I've actually uh, wired the PS2 connector out to a couple different footprints just so that I could orient the connector different and put this in a different case. I'll show you that when I show you the board in a moment. And then I have a bunch of pins from the uh, Atmega coming out here to a 25 pin connector. So the pinout you can find online, you can find out both the 25 pin pinout for the uh, IBM PC compatible uh, printer port as well as you can find the 36 pin pinout. Uh, for a Centronics connector. So I actually wired it to both with the idea that if I wanted to I could put on my uh, typewriter board, I could put the male Centronics connector directly on the board um, and be able to plug the board directly into the back of a printer. Um, or I can use the DB25 and connect uh, to a cable uh, like the type of cable I have on the printer right now. Um, so the pinouts, like I say, you can learn those online. They're simple enough. I did put some protection resistors in here and here. So those protection resistors I often put in when I have a device that is sending out signals and I just want to make sure that a stupid error on the microcontroller doesn't accidentally emit a signal on a pin that conflicts with a signal being emitted by the printer and short something out and damage something. So I throw these, you know, like 100 to 150 ohm resistors in on those particular lines. Um, the other lines that don't have the resistors, those are purely 
um, inputs to the printer so there's no need to have any protection on them. Um, in a production device you just wire these straight across and programming uh, sorted out. So here is the board itself. You can see here's the DB25 connector, here's the PS2 keyboard connector, here is a barrel jack for 5 volt, here is the Atmega328, um, we've got pull up on the PS2 port, uh, and we've got all these protection resistors, the LEDs, the programming port, the fuse. Um, here are the spare footprints for the PS2 connector, you know, in case I wanted my keyboard connector to come up down there or up there. And down here is a footprint for the Centronix 36, so you can leave the DB25 off and then put the, the C36 on. I, I think I designed it so it mounts from the bottom if you do that. Um, and then you can plug it directly in the back of the printer. Now, a male Centronix 36 uh, right angle solder pin connector is really super hard to find. There were only found like two places selling them. One was in the States, one was in Canada. Um, I did end up ordering a couple of those and I'll try to build the variant that plugs it directly into the printer at some point, but it's just kind of hard to find that old school connector. Um, the DB25, of course, easily sourced. Now one thing that's super nice about this printer is it actually came with a manual. Look at that, there's stuff in here. Um, you know, you just don't get that with computers anymore. Uh, you know, it's not only telling you how to use a thing, but it's actually got all of the escape sequences in here to do stuff, like um, vertical motion escape sequence, half line backspace, line feed, um, underscore mode, all that's in here. Um, if you, there's dip switch settings are all documented, the serial protocol is in there. So even all the way down here into the parallel interface, if you didn't know how to do a parallel interface, it's actually documented right here in the book, you know, the pinout for the parallel interface, the meanings of the wires in the interface, the timing diagram for, you know, this is how you transfer parallel data. You put your data on the bus, you hit it with a strobe, then it's busy for a while, then the printer sends back an acknowledgement bit. So I was actually able to write my typewriter software just by looking at this documentation that came with the printer. You know, you just, you just don't get this kind of thing this day and age. It's not like you'd go buy yourself a new Brother or HP printer at Office Max and it'd come with an addendum, you know, here's the USB protocol if you want to implement your printer. Uh, this is just really demonstrates how the world has changed from um, something where some technical knowledge might be necessary to, to integrate a new peripheral to the situation where these things are plug and play and nowadays you expect to just take home your printer, plug it into your computer and the computer knows what to do with it. It wasn't always that way. Okay, let's give this a shot. So I've got the typewriter board over here. It's hooked up to my Philco Cherry MX keyboard and out the back through a cable to the printer. Now let's start typing. So it seems to be working. So you notice if I type fast enough, it'll buffer the keys. For example, so you heard it kind of do a da 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 It's because it buffered several key presses together. Um, but it seems to be working about as expected. And I've implemented caps lock, so we can turn on the caps lock. We should see keys that are capitalized. I don't know if you can see the print well, real well or not. I'll take a closer, uh, closer shot at the print in a moment. Uh, but now let's try some typing. Quick brown fox jump over the lazy dog. Now is the time for all the men to come to the aid of their country. I think I screwed that one up. Let me try it again. Country. Hopefully that's a little better. And there they are in good clear printing. I would say this works. So I did implement a couple of the function keys to do a few things. So I think F5, I've turned that to bold. So you notice if it's bold, you'll get two taps for each time you push a key. So 
you hear two quick taps. Uh, let's see, how does that look? Yeah, it looks a little darker. Uh, let me, F10 will turn the bold off. F6 will turn on shadow. So that will print a character and then move a little bit to the side and then print again. Yeah, so that's even, uh, that's even darker. That's really dark. Then F7 should turn on underline, but I, it wasn't working for me. I'll see if, see if it works here. Yeah, underscore mode, I couldn't get that to do anything. According to the manual, that should have worked, but it didn't. Uh, anyway, let's take a look at the print sample up close. Okay, here's a close-up on the printed page. So, you know, here's where I was just typing random characters on the keyboard. Here's where I tried my sentences. I think they turned out pretty good. Uh, this one here was bold. Bold doesn't look to me much different than standard. This is the shadow print. That definitely looks dark. I kind of like the shadow print. Shadow print looks like bold. Um, and then this one down here, this was the one where I told it to underline. And like I say, maybe, maybe I've done something wrong in my programming because that doesn't look like underlining to me. Thank you for watching my video. Please visit my website at www.smbaker.com for more electronics projects and sandrail stuff. Bye.